Today's topic, applying cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate to clinical practice. Now in my first video in this series, comprehending cardiac output, I discussed in detail each determinant of cardiac output and why it must be understood and applied to the bedside. This includes the importance of understanding and defining stroke volume, preload, afterload, Starling's Law and Contractility. If that's not a strength for you, go to my first video and then catch up with number two. Now, let's talk about applying clinical cardiac output to clinical practice. And we're gonna use essentially three, some use four scenarios and look at what they each have in common. The first scenario is June, a 52-year-old woman who is six hours post-op with a posterior spinal fusion. She has no fever, but heart rate and blood pressure preoperatively were 78 and 132 over 80. Since her return to the surgical floor, her heart rate has been consistently in the 100s with a blood pressure of 100 over 60. Scenario number two. James, a 45-year-old man who presents to the ED intoxicated and a large coffee ground emesis. His heart rate initially is 110 and his blood pressure is 80 over 40. Scenario number three. Jennifer, a 68-year-old woman who is post-op day number two with a hemicolectomy due to a bowel obstruction. Her heart rate and blood pressure pre-op were 90 and 110 over 82. She spiked a temp to 101 over 1012, and her heart rate is now 105, and her blood pressure is 100 over 60. And finally, number four, John, a 68-year-old man admitted with heart failure exacerbation who has ischemic cardiomyopathy and an ejection fraction of 15%. His resting heart rate is consistently 90 to 100. Now, in order to clinically reason, by recognizing relevant clinical data and grasp the essence of each of these four clinical scenarios, the nurse must be able to not only merely understand, but have an applied knowledge of this essential pathophysiologic formula to clinical practice, CO equals SV times HR. So let's talk about this and see when we look at these scenarios with our first scenario, why is there an elevation of heart rate with a lower blood pressure? Though sepsis is possible with this first early post-operative scenario, it is unlikely because of the short time frame after surgery and the temperature is normal. The most common and likely explanation early post-op is that the patient has a fluid volume deficit and is dehydrated. Therefore, it's causing, as you remember, an elevation in heart rate because of lower stroke volumes related to a decrease in preload or what's coming to the right side of the heart. The body is a tank, and if that fluid volume is too low, it's going to influence what's gonna to come to the right side of the heart, and therefore the body's going to compensate by increasing heart rate to maintain adequate cardiac output. Let's go to our second scenario. In this scenario, the nurse must recognize what clinical data is relevant. This is a person with a GI bleed who's intoxicated with coffee ground emesis. That information and in the coffee ground emesis must be that immediate red flag we have most likely, the reason it's coffee ground, digested blood. He's bleeding, usually a gastric ulcer from being a chronic alcoholic is a likely assumption in this scenario. So therefore, he has a GI bleed. He's bleeding internally. And he had a heart rate that was significantly elevated and a blood pressure that is too low. That captures the severity in clinical practice. When you have a patient who is tachycardic with a high heart rate, but they're unable to maintain adequate cardiac output, that blood pressure is going to be decreased as well. This is why in early shock, the heart rate will merely be tachycardic or elevated, but the blood pressure will be within normal limits. It won't be a critical concern. That's why the nurse must recognize that when there is the tachycardia, it is a clinical red flag. There's a reason 
The body was created to compensate and maintain adequate cardiac output in any volume, fluid volume deficit state. Let's go to our third scenario. In this uh, scenario, we must look at the trend of where this data is going. Jennifer was the one with the hemicolectomy. She had a fever that spiked. Her heart rate is now elevated from 90 to 100 and her blood pressure has dropped from 110 over 82 to 100 over 60. In this scenario, clinical reasoning requires that the nurse trends everything, including the most important vital sign in nursing assessment data. As we look at this trend, the heart rate is elevating, the blood pressure is decreasing, and the temperature is rising. This clinical data, when trended and compared, clearly suggests a problem, which most likely, if we understand the elevation of our heart rate and the blood pressure beginning to drop, we, and the fever elevation, we clearly have a presentation of sepsis progressing to septic shock. The nurse must recognize the significance of this data in order to rescue. If the nurse sees this as no problem, the patient will continue to deteriorate until that blood pressure is in the toilet, literally, and by then it may be too late. The fourth scenario was our patient with heart failure. John has a 15% ejection fraction and his resting heart rate is always in the 90s to 100s. The nurse must recognize the significance of this clinical data and recognize what's a normal ejection fraction. It's about 60 to 70%. And 15%, again, that's 15% of the stroke volume of what's in that ventricle is being ejected. Instead of 60% being ejected, we're kicking out 15% or one-fourth of the normal stroke volume. So therefore, if we understand that his end-stage heart failure is one-fourth what it should be, does that explain his tachycardia to maintain adequate cardiac output? Absolutely. And when the nurse has a deep understanding of this formula to clinical practice and these wide variety of clinical settings that we've gone over, you can see how important this formula is to clinical practice. Now let's talk about orthostatic blood pressure changes. What is a positive orthostatic and what is a negative orthostatic blood pressure? This is something that even fundamental textbooks don't agree on. But if you understand cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate, you as the nurse will be able to use this knowledge and correctly interpret orthostatic blood pressure findings. Let me share a clinical example. I recently cared for a 52-year-old woman who came to the ER by her family because she was having nausea, vomiting repeatedly, as well as diarrhea in the last 12 hours. I completed my nursing assessment and performed an orthostatic blood pressure and heart rate to see if there were changes consistent with a volume fluid deficit. I collected the following data. The heart rate was 72, lying, and the blood pressure was 138 over 84, lying. I stood the patient up, waited 30 seconds, did the heart rate. It was now went from 72 to 92, but the blood pressure was 130 over 80. Now, when you trend this data, is this a negative or is this a positive orthostatic blood pressure? The blood pressure didn't really change but the heart rate went from 72 to 92. So we had a significant elevation in our heart rate. Question is why? Why would there be such a, a significant elevation by just simply standing up at the bedside? That's not a lot of physical activity. It's because when there is a fluid volume deficit due to a, a lack of preload, that stroke volume is low, therefore your heart rate's gonna elevate to maintain cardiac output. Therefore, the blood pressure may be normal in early to moderate states of volume depletion or shock, but the heart rate will always be tachycardic unless they're on a beta blocker and it's blocking that normal sympathetic response. Fundamental textbooks sometimes don't even address the importance of the heart rate.
as it relates to orthostatic blood pressure. It is not only about the blood pressure. The heart rate is very significant, and in this scenario, is, is something the nurse must be aware of and recognize the significance. This was a positive orthostatic blood pressure because of volume depletion that fits the clinical picture of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea repeatedly. So when we look at correctly interpreting orthostatic blood pressures, I would like you to remember the number 20. Why is that important? Let's talk about that. When you look at the heart rate, I have seen in my own clinical practice that if the heart rate increases by 20 beats, even if the blood pressure stays normal, that is a positive orthostatic finding. It also applies to the blood pressure. If you have the blood pressure, so if the heart rate increases by 20, that's a positive finding. But when the blood pressure, I'm referring to primarily the systolic blood pressure, drops by 10 to 20, that too is clearly a positive orthostatic finding. And when you see both the heart rate elevation and the blood pressure decrease by at least 10 to 20 in the same orthostatic standing up, that's telling you that that patient is most likely moderately to severely dehydrated or in a shock state. That's why it's a critical concern when you have a person who's at a post-op patient who is at risk for sepsis, has both a rising heart rate as well as a sliding blood pressure, you must assume septic shock until proven otherwise, especially if the temperature begins to elevate, but it can also decrease with the elderly, it can throw you a curveball, even the very young pediatric patients. So when we look at defining it, we recognize that some patients' ambiguity will be a little bit different, but 10 to 20, either up on the heart rate or low in with the blood pressure, that's what you want to remember in clinical practice to recognize the relevance and significance of your orthostatic blood pressure. Now, when we look at nursing education, according to the Carnegie Foundation's research in 2010, Patricia Benner recognized that, entitled her book, Educating Nurses, A Call for Radical Transformation. Nursing education still requires change yet today. And I want to encourage every nurse educator to embrace the responsibility, to emphasize the need to know content and have strength in the learning of your students, to deeply understand content that is most important. This is just one of many concepts that every student must deeply understand and not just have memorized to pass a test. And as we look at these concepts, I wanna encourage you to basically uh, recognize that I've created a resource that I wanna share with you. It's a, essentially a written mentor of my 30 plus years of clinical practice. And what I found to be most important as a, as a nurse, primarily in acute care, but also in a wide variety of settings as well, it's titled Think Like a Nurse practical preparation for clinical practice. And it helps to kind of highlight the essence of what is the need to know content that I've seen relevant in my clinical experience, as well as emphasizing the thinking of clinical reasoning in order to make a correct clinical judgment. Both educators have found it a resource as well as students. And I wanna encourage you to go to my website, keithrn.com and the store on the homepage and that resource is available for those that would like to consider it. I recently received an email from a nursing student who said the following. I've referred to this book, Think Like a Nurse, countless times throughout nursing school and I know it will be a great reference as I go along in my career. Every time I have re-looked at it, I see new things or see them with a different perspective. Your book has helped me to recognize my own personal growth and has been the most foundational book in all of my nursing education thus far. I'd like you to also know that I've got other videos on my YouTube channel, Think Like a Nurse, and I'd like you to check those out, or better yet, subscribe and be first in line when a new video comes out. You can also follow me at Twitter, at Keith Risher, as well as my Facebook, Think Like a Nurse. I want to thank you all for doing what you are doing to be a part of the needed change and strengthening nursing education for the next generation. Thank you.